she sees something in me that is more valuable to her than Canadian work experience and has offered me a contract position. This is exciting work, very different from the mind-numbing, num crunching work that I previously had. My job is to find money, organize events, and generally to be kind of odd jobs person. She is my first mentor, and she takes, me, she takes great pains to show me how things are done here, what to say, and more importantly for me, what not to say. So I remain yours somewhat dejectedly, but still in hope. Let me end that. The next letter is written 10 years later, June 1991. Dear Canada, today it is exactly 10 years to the date since we arrived in Canada. I'm happy to tell you that time is proving to be a great healer. The clouds have not entirely lifted. After years in occupational exile, both my husband and I are, if not exactly in our positions, but around careers that have a future around our education. After first starting and shutting down a small business, then gaining a foothold as a technician, my husband is finally employed as an engineer. I have been practical. I realized long ago that nobody in their right minds in Toronto would want to learn German from an Indian who's just come from Iran. So I have, with the help of my wonderful mentor, reinvented myself completely and found meaningful work, if maybe not a career in the not-for-profit world. There have been other silver linings to our clouds. We are slowly but surely becoming part of a community Primarily, primarily through our children's schools. I have learned that it is not disrespectful in Canada to ask and challenge teachers in schools. In fact, the more you ask and challenge, apparently the better your children do. There are a few instances that stick out in my mind as critical first experiences of belonging. We have enrolled our older daughter in a gymnastics club in order to make sure she does not watch too much television. And even though I have no understanding of the sport, I spend most Saturdays hauling a variety of children to remote, strange locations all over small town Ontario, like Aurora and Trenton and Chatham for competitions. And with other mornings, every morning, early mornings, we make coffee, sandwiches, and a very strange Canadian culinary confection from hell called peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It is during these early mornings that I sense the connection to people who are different from me, but also very much like me. It is these experiences of collectivism, raising money, making sandwiches, planting bulbs in neighborhood gardens, finding similarities across differences that join us in a society that I perceive is very highly individualistic and the, where the rights of the individual are primary. I have taken another very important step, looking at my own experience and that of my immigrant friends. A small group of us have come together to do something about wasted talent and wasted opportunities. We have developed a concept to provide employment counseling to immigrants so that those who come next will not face the disappointment and waste of time that we experienced. And lo and behold, our member of parliament meets with me we are awarded the grand sum of $75,000 to set up this new center. And I begin to learn a whole new set of responsibilities. Finding a board, hiring an executive director, raising more money. It's a very steep learning curve, indeed. But the best part of these last 10 years is that in 1987, I became your loyal citizen. You gave me another piece of paper this time, much more formal that declared to all and sundry that I was a member of your family and, can, and I can now officially call myself by your name. I am Canadian. It is indeed a strange sensation to become part of a family even when there are no blood ties. I have taken the step seriously, bought a number of books on your history, spent time with a citizenship teacher, learned about the Plains of Abraham, and the early years of confederation and know the names of all 10 provinces and all the territories and all the premiers by heart. I also know now that this path from exile to belonging has been shared by thousands who came before me 
and will be shared by thousands who come after me. I have read about the cold weather farmers from the Ukraine who came to Canada in 1913 to settle the West, about the British orphans who were sent to Canada after the Second World War, about the Chinese who built our railroad from east to west, about the Ugandans who found refuge here, about the boat people from Vietnam, about the Italians who came hoping to find the streets paved with gold, only to find out that there was no gold because there were no streets and they in fact had to pave the streets. The Portuguese, the people of the Caribbean, Iraqis, Afghanis, Filipinos, Indians, wave after wave of people, all in search of a better life, each in a sense a refugee, just arriving at different times from different places. I know now that I am in my own small way part of this history. I am able to find an, emo an emotional connection with the rest of you, with those who came before me and those who came, who will come after me to this global place with its global soul. Knowing what I do know about you, Canada, I wonder how you do this. How do you keep your soul and share it with those who do not have a common history with you? What makes you so translucent, so willing to define and redefine your identity? Is this not a problem, I wonder? And in reflection, I find the, I find the answer. Of course, this is not the problem. This is, in fact, the answer. This is Canada's secret, to always be a work in progress, never to be a finished product. I look at my two children, who are a strange and wonderful mix of the many cultures in our lives, Indian, Iranian, German, Canadian. They identify with all these different identities, but they are mostly Canadian. I rejoice in the freedoms they take for granted, especially as young girls. They question everything, especially authority, especially mine. They're just as comfortable eating hot dogs and sushi, cheering baseball and cricket, watching Hollywood or Bollywood. I know when they are old enough, they and their friends will date, marry, and hang out with people from all over the world. I know that when they go to work, they will work alongside Chinese, Japanese, Somalis, and Irish. And I know that in all likelihood, their boss will be a woman. I marvel at this, and I thank God that they are young women in the freest society in the world. So I remain on their behalf and in renewed optimism at my own labor. The final letter I wrote a few weeks ago, Toronto, January 2011. Dear Canada, we have now known each other for almost 30 years. As I look back on these years, I am overwhelmed with a sense of appreciation for the life I have, the work I do, my friends and family. But most of all, I value the freedom we have and enjoy, and maybe sometimes take for granted. As I examine my emotions and search for a way to describe them, I am left with one overriding feeling. I belong. This intense feeling comes to me at strange moments, when every spring the daffodils in my neighborhood raise their sunny head, I know I belong. When I come back to Canada from overseas and I check in with a customer, customs officer who looks like me, I know I belong. And when I say what a glorious day it is and the temperature is only plus two, I know I must belong. <laughs> and when my heart stopped as Sidney Crosby put the puck in the goal in the overtime for Canada, even though I understand nothing about hockey, I know I belong. I also know that as a member of the Canadian family, I can and must play a part in dealing and healing the family problems that I have inherited, along with enjoying all the myriad benefits, our ongoing issues with reserve and unreserved aboriginals, the squabbles with Quebec, jurisdiction, poverty, injustice, inequality, healthcare, education. These are now my issues too. What advice should I give to new immigrants? First of all, I tell them to keep their names. But I also tell them about the bargain they have signed on. We must live up to our end, work hard, learn the ropes, the language, reach out and make new friends, invite more people to dinner, go bowling with them, obey the law of the land, 
even when these collide with personal values. Be open to new ideas and not be held hostage to old ones. Become members of associations, political parties, resident associations, environment book uh, movements, book clubs, sports clubs, knitting clubs. Get involved, speak up, vote. I tell them that standing on the sidelines is not an option for anyone, but it is definitely not an option for immigrants. Democracy belongs to all of us, but it always belongs more to those who participate in it. So partici participate we must. And finally, I tell immigrants, someone will reach out and help you. And so when it is time, remember to pay it forward. Canada, as for you, you too must live up to your end of the bargain. You put too much stress and attention on what the immigrant must do. You put out lofty ideals and fail to follow up with practical actions to realize these same ideals in a timely manner. You close your eyes to the fact that as future members of your society, we not only step into the metaphorical Canadian home, but in time, we will want to rearrange the furniture in it. After all, it is and will be as much our country as it is anyone else's. I know this is not hard for you because it is in your DNA. As a young country, you are willing to write your story, find your own narrative. Without the rigid constraints of centuries of history, war, and religion, you are free to create something new and different and unique. I have possessed three passports in my life. I was born an Indian, I married an Iranian, and finally Baker became a Canadian. The first was gained by birth, the second by marriage, but this last one I have earned. Yet, I belong, not unlike many immigrants, in more than one world. When I go back to India, the moment the aeroplane doors are opened, my knees go weak at the sights, sounds, and smells of the country where I was born. For the first two weeks, I am in thrall of the color, the noise, the music, the busyness of India, the incessant sound, conversations, and hustle. But after some time, I begin to grasp that I am a visitor, that I am both of that world, but not of it. I am more Canadian in my sensibilities, and the Canadianness in me is, is accentuated more so when I am not in Canada. And so I am always more than happy to come back to the place I call home. I see now that over these 30 years, how much like you I have become. We are both, Canada, you and I, slightly insecure, somewhat imperfect, overly sensitive, jealous of our rights, anxious about our responsibilities and our place in the world. We are fierce for being recognized for who we are. Nothing gets us more agitated than being confused with others. Our inherent modesty prevents us from being loud about our accomplishments, yet we know and recognize that a new confidence and pride is in the air. We have an uncurbed enthusiasm for the future, although neither of us quite knows how we're going to get there. We are both in the best spirit of optimism, still in the making, and I hope will always be so. For these and many other reasons, I remain your ever-admiring and loyal citizen, Ratna Omipa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ratna. I am sure all of you in the audience today can relate to the message that Ratna brought to you today. Um, what it takes uh, to be Canadian and the journey. It is a long journey, but there is progress as you can hear from uh, Ratna this morning. So thank you so much, Ratna, for your inspirational um, speech this morning.